Hello, I'm Rupert Turton and welcome to the Business Spotlight interview where we talk to local business owners about their journey. Today, I'm joined by Chris Durham from Wireless Alert Solutions, who make, uh, design, manufacture and supply fire safety equipment specifically designed to help uh, deaf and disabled people. So, Chris, welcome along. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. So, yeah. But first question, obviously, actually, okay. you, you probably need to explain a little bit more about what you do at Wireless Alert Solutions as well. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Um, well, you could sort of divide my career in two. I've been in this market for 20 years and um, it's, uh, you know, when I first got involved, it was just after the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act when it feels like a very long time ago now. Um, but the the heart and soul of what you're doing is saying, OK, 99% um, of buildings in the UK or around the world have uh, a fire alarm system, which is nearly always predominantly dependent on audible sounders. Um, and so uh, when the fire alarm goes off, those sounders go off. But of, of course, for hard of hearing and deaf people, but specifically for those who are severe or profoundly deaf, that's completely exclusionary. There's no way for them to access that. So it was it was capturing that nugget of an idea and saying, well, actually, whatever you're doing for the hearing people, you should be doing for the disabled people. You should be doing for the deaf people. And then traveling on from that, you know, what's the safest way of doing this? What's the best way forward? Um, the work that we do is involving um, uh, quite an old technology. In some ways, we we utilize um, high-powered uh, radio paging, which has been around since the, the 1960s. Yeah, the reason yeah, I do one of those when I first started work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, they'll be very familiar to people who were working in um, different industries back in the 80s, um, in the 90s, pre mobile phone. And why are we not using mobile phone? The very simple answer, that whole network that we use in the background, which is hugely convenient and very, very easy to, to access and so on and so forth, is also designed in such a way that you as the person, you are the person who has to go and find signal. So whether that's Wi-Fi or whether that's um, uh, signal via a, a, a local um, antenna and so on and so forth, if you haven't got signal where you are, move to where it is. But of course, that won't work for deaf people because they need to know that you know, that split second where you or I would go, oh, is that far along? Um, do we leave? Do we not? So on and so forth. They miss that. And it's that moment, if they're on their own, if they're separated, if they've gone to the loo, if they're sitting in a cubicle, that they're completely isolated. And it's trying to avoid that circumstance. And that's where it comes from. So for me, I've been evangelist for this for now 20 years. Um, I hugely believe in what we're doing and, and, and that we're doing a good job. I know that we're doing a good job because we've had lots yeah. of positive yeah. feedback. So yeah, that's, that's what it's really involved with. Yeah, and as a slightly technical question, do mm. does the does the pager is that um, does that belong to the the person or does that belong to the premises that they're visiting? Um, the focus is very much on the premises because, as you know, in 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 fire alarms, uh, same way as you have a, a smoke detector at home, you don't have a commercial fire alarm at home, so you're not you're not required as in a in a residential circumstance to have the same level of safety as you do in the office or in a factory or in a in a, in a university or college. So, because of that, what we're focused on is that commercial sector, and as such, the responsibility and the duty really lies with the building operator. And so, having somebody walk in and go, oh, well, I just I got this pager 10 years ago and I reckon I can get the fire alarm on it. Mm, yeah, no, the, that that should really go through disability access unit. It should go through HR. It should be, oh yeah, actually we use your pager. We've tested it. We know it works. There we go. So there's a question. Yeah. So you're in quite a specialized area market as well. So what are the biggest challenges running a business in the healthcare sector? Yeah. Um, we sit between sort of, several stools. So we're disability access, we're fire safety, which is by term is more fire safety than healthcare. Um, and additionally, it's that that disability awareness. Um, but importantly, it's operating with with building operators. It can be very frustrating. You do get a lot of pushback, um, mainly just ignorance. It's things being outside of people's ken and not thinking about it and just going, oh, yeah, well, I can just hear the fire alarm. It's like, hmm. Mm. That's, yes, you're right, you can. And so that's the big frustration. We're also, you know, uh, an intentionally and relatively small company. Yeah. We punch, you know, well above our weight. We have systems in with uh, Bloomberg at Bloomberg Place. We have systems in at GlaxoSmithKline headquarters at uh, uh, Imperial College London, at uh, University of Birmingham. You know, we've got 
big blue chip companies um, uh, who adopt our system. And I've kept it intentionally small because our power is around providing the consultancy, providing the surveys and commissioning systems and maintaining systems. And yeah, so from yeah. that point of view, I don't want to run an engineering company. I don't want to run a maintenance company. Uh, sorry, I don't want to run an electrical engineering company. What I mean, yeah. I don't want to do I want to focus on the stuff that we do. So by keeping niche, we can punch well above our weight and having really good business partners, um, fire alarm companies, and so on. Um, we don't tre tread on other people's toes, but there are real challenges around being small, and that's mm. that, that's also difficult. So what are the challenges what? around being small? Um, you have to avoid being stood on. You know, you have to stand up for yourself. You've got that whole situation where, um, unfortunately, in the market, um, people often mistake big for good and they think, mm. oh yeah, no, this company's, you know, this company's da, 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 they're going to be around forever. And you sort of look at the Carillions of the world and you go, really, really? These are, you yeah, know, we've got no debts. We've got no um, overheads. You know, we keep everything very light. We've got, you know, we've been in, we're in the market because we want to be in the market. We've built this company up from, from nothing and we haven't carried any debt through with that. So from that perspective, it's very, very different from a way a lot of companies sort of, invest heavily and then take on big debts and invest heavily and take on big debts and hope that the growth you know they can grow their way out of that trouble we've grown things organically <laughs> and we're also in a business where you know for every system that i sell i'm also selling a maintenance contract on the back of that i'm also selling support and other things like that so it's very customer focused it's also customer care focused and we've got clients that have been around yeah big clients have been around for 20 years um mm -hmm. which is really lovely um, you know, where we've got generations of members of staff coming in and go, oh, yeah, you're, good. you're these guys. Yeah, I've heard things about you, you know, and that's that's lovely. So that's the challenge is, is not getting pushed out. And you've got to keep your sort of consultancy credentials around you in terms of being able to punch above your weight from that point of view. Because yeah, the, yeah. the easiest thing in the world is for somebody to say, oh, yeah, they're not as big as us. What does that mean? What does that yeah. mean? Yeah. You know, we've we've got a very good example at, uh, at a, uh, one site at the moment where a client has chosen exactly that, and 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 we're they're they're phasing out our system after twelve years, and um, the company they've got in to do it is now we're fourteen months into being replaced. Fourteen months should have been replaced yeah. fourteen months ago, and you're sort of sitting there, and I'm getting emails from them saying, you know, at that site, how did you manage to get coverage there? I haven't answered that email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, and that's the um, that's the thing. So, as my my father used to say, he used to work in the oil industry and and um, sorry, uh, power industry, and they used to do water purification systems for power, uh, for power stations. And they do a design, and then they go off and buy the same design from another company, and then yeah, eventually yeah. they would have to come back and go, "It's not quite working how we wanted it to. What did you do?" <laughs> how to do it and i think that's the expertise you have to hold on to yeah absolutely yeah hold it it's the knowledge behind it that, that really matters mm -hmm. so what's your biggest learning then been since you've been a business owner like you that's a big one i think becoming comfortable with a prickly jacket of responsibility mm -hmm. um and i always call it it's a prickly overcoat the prickly jacket and being confident about my ability to inspire and to lead people um because for a long time i wasn't for a long time i thought you know that was something magical that other people did and and a lot of the skills that i learned i didn't learn in the business i learned through volunteering um yep. so as well as doing what i do uh for wireless alert solutions i also um a i'm the chairman of um a recently constituted charity i've worked in, in uh, rotary i've been school governor and things like that and I, you learn a lot more, I think, when you work in organizations where the people who are there, the people you need to inspire aren't being paid because mm -hmm. you need to pay people in responsibility and gratitude and um, uh, promotion and, and, and I didn't, you know, recognition plays a huge part. And that has benefited me both in my interbusiness relationships in terms of um, bringing that sort of focus on to people and say, you know, and recognizing and, and things like that and not not sort of um uh just glad handing for the sake of it but actually using that credibility to advantage to 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 help people to recognize oh you know that's really valuable so when i give a compliment people are like no thank you that 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 makes a difference because i don't yeah. just have it really nearly and i think there's that 
And what I've learned inside the charity sector has massively benefited what I do in, in business. And I recommend that to anybody running a business is get involved in local uh, charitable works because you'll find it a lot harder because you're not paying people's wages. So you can't just tell people what to do. You have to inspire them. You have to show, you know, the, the classic kind of, uh, I can't remember the writer, but the the leadership skills, you know, the 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 um the different leadership skills of thinking about the wider good. How do we take that forward and so on? Yeah. Okay. So saying all that, then, what have you learned about yourself during your business journey? Ooh, I don't think I'd know as much about myself if I wasn't in business. I think that part of the thing of working for other people is that you can compartmentalize a lot and just ignore a lot about yourself being running this business has stretched me um to breaking point sometimes and has put me under a an enormous amount of stress at other times um you know on a on a negative scale you could say you know it's damaged my mental health at certain points because you can question everything in this kind of environment but that's the whole point isn't it you're not playing it safe you can go and get a salary job. I can go and get a salary job tomorrow and mm -hmm. not play it safe. That's the whole point while I'm in the business is, is to make, make a difference and to think, yeah. and I'd rather be in a business that I care about passionately, that I'm evangelical about the subject that I want to make a difference in the world. Um, you know, the main focus for me is, is, is not making the money because that's, I think that's a big mistake in sales. So much of sales is focused on money and they go, Oh, just, it's just about making the money. So no, 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 no. It's the faith you have in the product that sells the product. The money is the thing that happens afterwards that people go, yeah, I think this is worth it. And, yeah. and that's, I think that's just such an important thing for, for young people getting into sales. And it's what I teach, teach people when, when they're looking at that is, you know, if you just look at it from the point of view, if, you, if you're getting into sales because you're avaricious and you're greedy and you want to do this, that's great. You'll find certain jobs, but the ones who really succeed are the ones who believe. Who can believe in the product and believe in the thing and that's that's really powerful and actually what's really interesting reading, reading between the lines of what you said there it's the people who um actually see the benefit of what they're trying to sell to somebody who are going to be the best in that world actually yeah. this is about what the customer needs not about my commission check at the end of the quarter absolutely and it's that consultant sale of and, and so many times you know I'm, I'm what i love about running a business is i can take the hit yeah i can turn around and say I'm going to do the right thing and I don't care that it's going to cost me thousands of pounds because I'm going yeah. to do the right thing. And I can have faith that that will pay off. And 99% of the time it pays off in the future because yeah. nothing, nothing builds customer loyalty, like putting yourself out of pocket for yeah. the customer because they turn around and go, what? You didn't need to do that. No, I know. But that was the right thing to do. And they yeah. go, wow, wow. That's really what? And I, you, I sort of think, <laughs> I think it's quite, I still think it's quite rare. And I think it's very strange in this world where we've got such hyper-focused on the, the images of businesses. I find it very strange when I come across businesses that are openly mendacious and who will absolutely are trying to screw everybody out of money. And as soon as you get into a relationship with you, you say, you're not here to actually create a great product or to look after it. You're just here to milk this and milk this as hard as you can. And I think there's such a, such a strange self-defeating process. Yeah. Because you're going to get found out. Because the problem is, is even if you're really good at hiding it as a business owner, the people that you employ underneath you will learn that culture very, very quickly. And all of a sudden, it will le and it leaks out like oil. And people can smell it a mile off, and they're gone. They're absolutely gone. So it's it's that whole thing. It's not just it's not about being a white knight. It's about being a good guy. It's not that. It's about doing the right thing. And sometimes yeah, yeah. the thing is not about just how much money can I make out of this or how much money I can make out of that. It's, it's long term. Where does my credibility sit? It's investing in your own reputation and making sure that people, you know, respect not just your product and things, but you as a person. And go, hey, that guy, that guy took a hit for us. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, there's a whole, the, obviously, it's about relationships, but it's also yeah. about culture as well, isn't it? Culture yeah. inside your business and making sure that your business has the sort of culture that, that you want it to. Yeah, I've never I've never been prouder than when my own staff have we've had somebody being difficult, whatever it is, somebody being unreasonable, mm -hmm. and my own staff have felt totally confident about dealing with that 
and managing it and coping with it and dealing with it fairly because they know how I would want it to be dealt with. And I think as as soon as that happens, you know you've got the right people, the right place, the right thing, because they'll push back when they know that, you know, they'll push back when they know they've got it right. But they'll also, they'll come back and go give way or or go check that and everything else. I think it's so easy as a business owner to be kind of hyper defensive and to spend every time going, oh, you know, you know, you can't take that. And coming back at people very, very hard over, you know, or something. It takes one moment to say, let me check on that. I'll just go away. I'm just going to check out. I'm going to take your consideration seriously, what you're saying. We'll take it seriously. We're going to go away, check on it, and I'll come back. There's so much of an instinct to just hit back. Yeah. You know, and it, and it's a very dangerous, and especially for young people as well in the social media environment, it's a really dangerous thing to do because it 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 the damage is done then. And you've got to work 10 times harder to rebuild the trust if you do that. And that's the issue. So it's, it's you know, that's the uh, that's what I... I and yes yeah so with all that said then mm. what are your aspirations for wireless alert solutions over the next five ten years that's a big question um if you'd asked me five years ago i had very different aspirations um mm. i think part of the challenge is i'm 46 now yeah and part of the challenge is it changes as your time changes so, you know, you could be going, oh, yeah, no, I want to sell the company. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to improve the EBITDA. I want to blah, 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 you know, go and speak to some purchaser, buyer, whatever it is. I want to get an angel in and help us build the company up and everything else. Um, I am acutely aware of the fact that I've got a 16-year-old daughter now who's interested in engineering. She's looking at pursuing a career in engineering. She may not be involved in anything we do in the future. Um, I've got people that are working for me now who could take up the reins in the future. So from my perspective, it's kind of like, and also I think part of me is thinking, you know, retirement is now getting, you know, by the time I reach 70, chances are retirement will be 70. Mm-hmm. And even if I can retire early, will my wife be able to retire early? Will, you know, what, what, what's the implications for my other colleagues? So how do I make this sustainable as a business in the long term? Yeah. to bring yeah. new blood in and to keep it vibrant and to keep it alive and so on, so on as long as we can. So the changes that I'm thinking about now are more about sustainability and training and embedding a culture and creating this sort of bedrock, um, growing the business, but continuing to grow the business organically. Because the beauty of the business is, you know, we can win a whole university like we did last year. We won Aston University. We won a whole yeah. business university. That's great. That's a big order, everything else. The important part is the ongoing relationship and the maintenance of that client, yeah. because that's that's a lot of the 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 bedrock of the 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 cash flow of the company of the profitability. You know, nothing's as profitable as maintenance. You know, that's the you know outside of insurance is even more profitable. But you know, if you've got maintenance, that's that's a profitable world of business. So yeah, my positions change really, and I'm seeing now things in a more kind of longer term i think i'm being forced to i've probably got another 25 years 20 years at least in the business so i've got to change this business into something that i can exist in and that those around me can profit from and and we can all sort of work forward together and that's i think where i am at the moment so what will change not a huge amount technology technology will always change and there will be challenges that come down the road um (laughs) But certainly where I am with the Bridge Standards Institute on BSI committees, things like that, very much enjoying that, putting some effort into that. Um, you know, uh, I've gone down a path of really trying to promote and, and, and build aggressively build the business, and it's created a load of risk. Yeah. That's what I've done, and it's put things, put things back, really. So I think steady, steady, build the company, build our relationships with our externals, build that network, Build the influence and so on within the British Standards Institute and so on and so forth, and then and then see where we go from there. Because I think for a lot of businesses right now, post twenty sixteen, you know, I'm doing okay is probably the best. A lot of a lot of saying some have got fantastic growth, and that's brilliant. That's really aspirational. But I'm doing okay is is what I, where a lot of people are, um, and I think that that being realistic about what happened in the last four years, goodness only knows what's going to happen in the next four years. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Your plans may change. 
<laughs> yeah, if we could forecast the future, life would be a hell of a lot oh, easier. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Who else needs a time turner? That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Cool. Um, so, one last question for you, then, mm. Chris. Who is the first person that comes to mind when you think about success? Ooh, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. It's do you know what? in this day and age, it's hard to find an untarnished body, if you know what I mean. It's, you know what I mean? It, you know, you sort of look at look around at the successful people and, you know, it's hard to find someone who hasn't got a litany of carnage behind them at some point or another. You know, it's it's that's that's the reality. But for me, someone I've always admired greatly, and it's, it's an actor, and someone that I've always admired greatly by who's, I think, had an amazing track record and work rate and, and, and crafted a space for himself is, of all people, Denzel Washington. Okay. And I think that it, it, totally outside of the business space, the way he manages himself and manages his sort of reputation and, and the way that he interacts with people, whether he's on screen, off screen, everything else, it, he comes across as a consummate professional. Now, this yeah. might age really badly. There may be a scandal that comes out in three weeks' time. Goodness only knows. But for me... You sort of look around and you cast around. And you sort of say, "Well, who would I like to not be compared to?" But if people were looking at me at the end of my career or an obituary or something like that, I'd love. I love it if if I was in that kind of caliber of of respect and and admiration and and stuff like that. That's a huge ask. That's an absolute yeah. huge yeah. ask. But that's the sort of space where I look to it. Whereas I find that I find a lot of business leaders that I look to where I think oh yeah no they were really successful they were really successful there's a lot of cost on the way there mm. it's a lot of cost and maybe they didn't pay it but there is a lot of cost and I, I sort of look at that and think you know and 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 also you know there's a I, I'm a big fan of the uh was it John Ronson uh book um the psychopath test um this really good book where he yeah. basically goes through sort of okay what what how do you find a sociopath psychopath and so on and so on and then he goes out to the market and he goes, well, hang on a minute, this guy, this guy, um, this guy, uh, this press, this guy running for president, this Donald Trump, yeah. he's, got a lot, he's ticking a lot of boxes here. And actually within the business community, a lot of the most successful people who are out there tick yeah. an awful, awful lot of those boxes of like, wow, okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So, so yeah, I'm not sure a lot of the people who are massively successful but I'm very happy because I think that's their, their motivation comes from their drive. So, yeah, I think that's a, there's a balancing act to be had there. <laughs> cool. What a great point to end on as well, Chris. So, I've, it's been lovely talking to you today. Um, if anyone Pleasure does want to, uh, to contact you and uh, Wireless Alert Solutions, how do they do that? Uh, you can find us on our website, www.wasol.co.uk. That's W-A-S-O-L. Um, alternatively, you can contact us on 01858790060, or you can email us at sales at wasol.co.uk. Excellent. Chris, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for your time today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Rupert.